it is a particular pleasure to introduce Jim Al-Khalili for this uh, very special plenary lecture. So Jim describes himself on his uh, webpage as theoretical physicist, author, and broadcaster. And um, I think we will benefit from all of these experiences uh, in, his, in his presentation. He's really highly accomplished in all these areas. I mean, he has been awarded uh, many prizes, um, including the Faraday Medal of the Royal Society and the uh, Hawking Medal. And uh, his programs are very popular. I enjoyed particularly his book on quantum biology, in fact. And uh, so this is, this is wonderful that he's here. And in connection to his talk, in the title of his talk, I would also like to highlight that um, he has established what is perhaps the first doctoral training center in quantum biology worldwide to really facilitate this interdisciplinary learning that is necessary to do successful uh, and groundbreaking research in this field. And so I'm very much looking forward to the lessons that um, Jim can teach us here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin, for that nice introduction. And thank you to the organizers for the invitation uh, to give this talk. As Martin mentioned, I'm a theoretical physicist. I, in fact, I started life as a, as a nuclear physicist. So most of my background for, say, 25 years after my PhD, I was studying, doing quantum scattering calculations to look at nuclear structure. So very much everything is quantum. Inside the atomic nucleus, everything is quantum. If we can get away with what's called a semi-classical approximation to make the thing simpler, then that's a big triumph. Everything is quantum. So when I come to... To, to look at whether there are quantum effects in biology, which I will talk about uh, here. Uh, for me, it's not magic. It's not, it's not even surprising if there are quantum effects inside living systems. The question is proving that they exist, proving they have a functional role, uh, and then, of course, whether even, uh, as I think Vladko uh, alluded to, whether life has, has selected for some of those, those mechanisms. So uh, I want to give the, 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 the talk in, in three stages. Uh, say something about the history uh, of quantum biology, how it started, how far, far back it goes, and then talk about some of the current research we're doing at Surrey, uh, and then more briefly, the future, since the future is less well-known. What's the famous quote? Uh, uh, pre uh, uh, prediction is very difficult, especially when it's about the future. So, uh, so, so therefore, that's probably just a couple of slides. Okay, so uh, I guess the, uh, the origins of looking for something beyond the, 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 so the basic, you know, where the building blocks of matter, what distinguishes life from non-life, uh, goes a long way back to the, the, probably the end of the 19th century. Um, certainly there was reductionism, the idea that you can break something up into, into pieces, uh, you know, like a watch, and then put it all back together again, uh, and it's just basically the sum uh, of, of its parts. On the other hand, you had this all, almost sort of mystical idea of vitalism, that life has something magical, special about it to distinguish it from non-life. And in the middle uh, uh, emerged a new school of thought called organicism, which says there's, there's nothing uh, 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 magical or mysterious about, uh, uh, about, uh, about life, but it may be that it, there are some new uh, uh, laws of physics and chemistry that, uh, that we haven't yet understood that can help us explain life. It goes back to uh, people like uh, Ludwig von Bertalanffy, the, 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 the father of uh, systems, uh, systems biology, um, who he, I mean, he claimed that uh, quantum biology, this is going back, you know, in the, interestingly, in the late 20s, just as, you know, molecular biology and experimental uh, results were emerging, but he was claiming that the field was stagnating and that somehow a new principle was needed to describe life. Around about the same time that, that quantum physicists were flush with the triumph of quantum mechanics, decided they'd solved all of physics and chemistry, and then they thought the biologists might need some help. And so they say, and it turns out the biologists actually didn't need much help uh, uh, back then. Uh, and so uh, certainly there was a sense of optimism. There were uh, experimental results measuring atomic weights of proteins, the discovery of X-ray mutagenesis, crystallization of viruses. These were all experimental results that were Looking down at this at the nanoscale, the sort of scale that people are, uh, uh, have been talking about at this conference, 
uh, without yet an understanding of what was actually going on. And then at the same time, of course, as I mentioned, uh, quantum physicists were uh, claiming that maybe quantum mechanics might play a role. Um, Vladko mentioned Niels Bohr's famous uh, lecture in 1933, life, uh, uh, Light and Life. Uh, even before that, in the late 20s, he was inspiring other physicists. People like Max Delbruck actually went and became a molecular biologist, but also people like Pascal Jordan. In 1929, uh, Bohr gave a, 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 a talk at a conference is it Bohr, when he, when he writes, famously, it's obscure, but nevertheless, I'll read this paragraph to you. He says, before I conclude, it will be natural at such a joint meeting of natural scientists to touch upon the question as to what light can be thrown upon the problems regarding living organisms by the latest developments of our knowledge of atomic phenomena, meaning quantum mechanics, which I have here described. Basically, is, is, is what we're understanding about the quantum world, does that have something to say uh, uh, about life? As I mentioned, he, he, he uh, inspired people like Pascal Jordan. Now, Jordan um, uh, worked uh, in Göttingen with Max Born. In fact, uh, he wrote the first to, with, with Max Born, the first of two classic papers on quantum mechanics. The second one, they are joined by a certain young Werner Heisenberg. Uh, so these two, two papers really laid the foundations for what we, we, the mathematics that we use today in quantum mechanics. I say this because I want to point out that Pascal Jordan is one of those people, the founding fathers. We tend to know about you know, uh, uh, Bohr and Born and, and Heisenberg and Schrodinger and Dirac and Fermi and, you know, right, and Pauli. Uh, Jordan may be less well known for, to, to non-physicists. Um, well, he published what would arguably be called the first paper on quantum biology, uh, um, uh, in, in which you know, he tried to uh, use some of the ideas uh, from uh, Niels Bohr's ideas about complementarity, uh, and the uncertainty principle of Heisenberg, and apply them in, in biology. Well, I mean, it was radical, but what happened? Why didn't, why, you know, is Pascal Jordan then you know, the, the, the father of quantum biology? Well, there's a problem. He was a Nazi. <laughs> and I don't mean the sort of, I will keep my head down and not complain and not, not speak out. No, he was a fully paid up fascist. Uh, and, and trying to sort of combine his political ideology with, with his scientific work. So, of course, quantum biology, unlike, for example, in a field of eugenics, uh, which, of course, is an awful, disgusting area of science, quantum biology nevertheless accidentally got infected by the reputation of one of the people who was pushing it. Uh, he wasn't the last person to, to think about whether quantum uh, mechanics plays a role in life, because uh, 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 Erwin Schrödinger, who, as far as I know, wasn't a Nazi, he was a bit of a womanizer and probably not very pleasant to his wife, but he wasn't a Nazi. But anyway, you know, his, his, he, he, um, he left uh, uh, and, and he moved to, to, to Ireland uh, in the 1930s and uh, started to be interested in the new then molecular biology and, and, and genetics. So this is a page from a notebook of his where you can start to see XY chromosomes. He's trying to uh, develop his lecture course for, for, for students. Um, at the same time, there were other ideas, you know, uh, St. Georgi was proposing that electrons can flow through biomolecules in the same way that you know, um, uh, they do through semiconductor devices, which of course is a, is a, qu a quantum mechanical effect. These were all very hand-wavy ideas. No one really was in a position back then to, to develop uh, the, the theories or indeed to, to carry out careful experiments. Most famously, of course, Schrodinger wrote the book What is Life in 1944, a book that um, inspired Crick and Watson. It's a book that's still in print today. It's a small book. It's almost like a popular science book. Uh, very uh, uh, interesting ideas. Um, in it, he, sent, he essentially says, uh, what is the difference between animate matter, life, and non-life of equivalent complexity? There are certain materials, when you cool them down to near absolute zero, a few degrees above zero Kelvin, they, the, the thermodynamic chaos is calmed down, and you start to see these quantum effects emerging, superconductivity, superfluidity. Schrodinger was arguing that maybe living uh, 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 systems, uh, certainly things like what he referred to as um, aperiodic crystals, had a similar 
they, they behaved in a similar way to inanimate matter near absolute zero uh, because of the order and the structure inside a living cell. So maybe there also you might see quantum effects uh, emerging. Nothing much really happened after that, uh, but every now and again there will be a, an important paper or a, a important move. I put together uh, a timeline, just a sort of a selection, so you can see that we have uh, so after uh, Bohr and Jordan and Schrodinger's book, of course, Crick and Watson, um, I will refer to this Levdin uh, work from the early 60s on proton tunneling in DNA because that's really relating to some of the work we're doing at Surrey. Uh, but, but there are landmarks, Devolt and Chance first showing, uh, using kinetic isotope effect, that um, uh, uh, enzymes can, can uh, cause, uh, make electrons quantum tunnel. Uh, the, the, the theory was developed by Hotfield to, to, to uh, confirm that. Um, Martin mentioned magneto uh, reception, the idea that certain animals uh, can sense the Earth's magnetic field, the orientation of the Earth's magnetic field to help them navigate during uh, their migratory journey. Uh, and, uh, and so that was confirmed in the 1970s. Of course, what wasn't understood was what was that, uh, how did that work? What was the, 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 the chemical compass that allowed these animals to do what they do? Um, and then, of course, uh, uh, the, the, it was suggested, Shilton proposed this radical pair mechanism. Um, the, the, the group in Berkeley, Judith Klinman's group in the late 80s, showed that enzymes uh, cata enzyme catalysis also uh, allows for protons to quantum tunnel, 2,000 times more massive than electrons. They're also undergoing, proton, uh, uh, undergoing quantum tunneling. Uh, 2007, famous paper by Greg Engel, together with Graham Fleming and others, um, purported to show experimentally through um, fluorescent spectroscopy that you could see long-lived quantum coherence in uh, photosynthesis. The idea that you know capturing uh, the, the, the photon of, of sunlight and delivering it to the reaction center in the cell, it doesn't just bounce around randomly doing like a random walk, because if that happens, uh, it's almost inevitably going to be lost as waste heat. But the argument was that it undergoes sort of quantum superposition of mul traveling multiple routes simultaneously that then uh, interfere constructively uh, uh, at the reaction center to make sure the particle is delivered. Uh, the, 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 sort of the analogy of that in, in popular science is the famous two-slit experiment in quantum mechanics where you fire particles, uh, uh, quantum entities, electrons, photons, neutrons, um, and as we heard, uh, Marcus Arndt in Vienna is, is sort of making bigger and bigger things that you can fire through these two slits, and they undergo this uh, famous interference pattern. Well, was this happening inside photosynthesizing plants and bacteria? Um, uh, a full uh, uh, model for what was happening in magneto reception was de uh, developed by uh, Ritz et al. And certainly there's a group in Oxford headed by Peter Ring who have been publishing uh, a lot of work on um, spin chemistry to show exactly what could possibly be a quantum mechanism for magneto reception. And then I've just uh, very uh, unabashedly uh, mention the, the uh, doctoral training center that Martin mentioned that we, uh, we created at the University of Surrey uh, uh, in 2018. Um, okay, really what got a lot of people interested in, in, in uh, this emerging uh, interdisciplinary field of quantum biology was this paper, uh, was an article by Philip Ball, the science writer uh, in Nature in, in 2011, you know, with the famous European Robin as the, as the poster child of quantum biology that because, it, because of its magneto reception. Well, I had got interested in this field before that, in fact, more than a decade before. Um, I mean, it was fun, uh, and I, it wasn't the day job, but I was collaborating with a molecular geneticist at Surrey, John Joe McFadden, with whom I then published the book. Um, uh, uh, here we go, there, there's his, my handsome colleague. Um, life on the edge. So basically, we brought together what we thought was happening in quantum biology, what are, what are the basic mechanisms and phenomena, starting from those that are sort of less controversial, enzyme catalysis and, and, and quantum tunneling, all the way to the insanely, ridiculously controversial that we don't believe, you know, quantum consciousness, quantum origin of life, and so on. So, and we make, that, we, we make it clear in the book, we don't believe this stuff, but it's, it's interesting. Um, 
And we, we, uh, the, the Leverhulme Trust uh, awarded uh, the university uh, a million pounds. The university then uh, added some more to, to, uh, uh, to, to give us more students. So basically, 21 PhD students is the first cohort. I think of uh, all of these, most of these now have their PhDs. Uh, they came from physics, from chemistry, from biology, from computer science, all sort of working, working together uh, in open plan uh, office. So it was, it was a challenge for them because, you know, the physicists were, were teaching the biologists the Schrodinger equation, the biologists were teaching them genetics 101, uh, and, and they were learning enough to be able to, to do their research. But of course, not, no one of them was going to write a, uh, a thesis covering everything. They had to, of course, specialize. Okay, so that was, that's what sort of brings us up to, to what's happening. What, what, what are we doing now, uh, for example, at Surrey? Well, I want to focus on an area that I've, I've got quite interested in, in in recent years, um, based on this work by uh, Per Olive Leuvdien uh, in the 1960s, proton tunneling in DNA and its biological implications. Okay, he talks about the electronic and protonic structure of biologically interesting molecules and systems has to be treated by quantum chemistry. This has led to the opening of a new field which has been called submolecular biology or quantum biology. His idea was that the hydrogen bonds, the protons that, that hold together the two strands of DNA, um, would prefer to sit in, in their lowest energy state closer to one strand than the other, closer to one nucleotide than the other, because these bonds are between the nucleotides uh, sitting on the, the, on the DNA. Uh, but those protons could transfer, could, could jump across to the other nucleotide on the other strand. And he argued that this could happen, um, and it could happen through classical means, just a water molecule knocking it over, or it could happen through spontaneous quantum tunneling. But the point being, if it does happen, when those two strands separate, when they unzip inside the helicase uh, in the process of replication, if that proton's sitting on the wrong nucleotide, that would lead to a mutation. So it was an interesting question. Are there point mutations caused by proton tunneling from one strand to the other? Well, uh, we started looking at this, you know, back in the 60s, they didn't have things like density functional theory uh, and sophisticated QMMM models to, to, to simulate some of these processes. Um, so looking, for example, at a pair, so adenine, as we know, bonds are thymine with a double hydrogen bond, guanine and cytosine have a triple uh, bond. Uh, we looked initially at adenine thymine, um, so though these, uh, these uh, dotted lines, these are hydrogen bonds, for me, they're just protons, right? I, because I come from nuclear physics, a hydrogen atom is just a proton. The electrons I leave to the chemists. Um, <laughs> um, so these protons can, 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 can jump from one side to the other. Uh, the, 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 the white ball, so these are, these are hydrogen, um, uh, linking nitrogen to nitrogen, nitrogen to oxygen between these two nucleotides, or just parts of them. Uh, and they can jump across, and the question was, how do, you, how do you calculate that? How do you model that? How do you work out uh, how likely that is to happen? Um, well, um, so the, the basic idea is, you know, the, the, the proton is essentially sitting in an asymmetric potential well, double potential well, like a ball that you have to roll up a hill over to, to the other side. Uh, in in, in, in uh, uh, stage one here, it's sitting in, in its regular position on one side, if it jumps across the other side, you get the tautomeric form of that nucleotide. Um, so that red ball, the proton, could hop classically over the top um, if it's got enough energy, or if it doesn't have enough energy, it could nevertheless potentially quantum tunnel through the barrier. This is, this is not magic. This is not something, well, ridiculous if you're coming up with these crazy ideas. Quantum tunneling is a thing, right? I mean, if quantum tunneling wasn't a thing, we wouldn't be here because the sun wouldn't shine. <laughs> because protons are basically quantum tunneling in thermonuclear fusion. And chemists are very perfectly happy with quantum tunneling. Uh, it happens all the time. The question is, does such a quantum process take place inside living cells? Um, so we wanted to find out what, the, uh, what, the, uh, what is the shape of the energy surface that these protons are feeling, but also, what is it? Is there something um, special about the cellular environment in the living cell that uh, helps the proton across, that maintains the, 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 the quantumness for long enough. The usual argument is the quantum mechanics is very, you know, these quantum effects are very delicate, very ephemeral. 
uh, and, and you get decoherence taking place very, very quickly. The, the quantum coherence is leaking out into the environment. Uh, and the hotter the environment, the messier, the noisier, the more complex it is, the faster the thing will decohere. Now, the, the, the living cell is a, is a busy place. And so the argument will be that surely quantum coherence could last only femtoseconds before it, it disappears. It's not going to have enough time to, to do anything uh, uh, spectacular. Um, well, uh, the calculations we do is it's a two-step process. The first thing we do is to map the potential energy surface, that double well that the, 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 the proton is seeing. And we use uh, density functional theory. Uh, uh, so this was work that was published a couple of years ago. Uh, and we looked at uh, AT and GC. And what we found, certainly for GC, uh, is that you do get a nice asymmetric potential with a, with a, a shallow well on the tautomeric side, so the, you could imagine the proton being excited up and, and tunneling across. For AT, there's a bit of a plateau. It doesn't look very uh, uh, amenable to holding on to uh, a, a, a proton with any significant lifetime there. So we focused our attention on the uh, proton transfer uh, uh, between G and C. Of course, there's a lot of things that are sort of hidden here uh, in the calculation. For example, this is a, just a one-dimensional reaction path. But of course, in, in, in building up this potential energy surface, we're looking at how the, these two bases, these mole large molecules, are geometrically rearranging themselves and changing their shape as the proton uh, mo moves across. Um, and also, you know, the idea that uh, these protons aren't doing it in isolation. In, in actually, just between t a pair of nucleotides, you've got two protons going across. And of course, these, these bases are all stacked, pi pi stacking. And what effect does that have? So trying to build in as much information as we can to these models, ultimately, to give us a static, time-independent potential energy surface. Then we rewind the clock and run, again, the dynamics of the proton in this time-independent uh, potential. Here is where we take account of the surrounding environment. Here we have to treat this as an open quantum system. So a quantum system, in our case, is the proton sitting in its potential well. Um, and, and the surrounding environment is the cellular environment. Basically, let's, let's think of it as, as a heat bath of water molecules. Uh, what the environment is doing is measuring the system, causing it to decohere. Vladko referred to this earlier. Uh, Equivalently, we can say the quantum system is leaking coherence, leaking information out into, into the environment. Uh, we, we choose for those who, who uh, know about open quantum systems, we solve a particular uh, um, equation called a master equation developed by Caldera and, and Tony Leggett uh, based on quantum Brownian motion. So it assumes the surrounding environment is basically a, a bath of harmonic oscillators because harmonic oscillators, physicists love them. They're, they're very good. We can solve problems and analytically easily with them. So it's a quite a, uh, it's a, it's an approximate model, but it, it allows us to, to understand and study the role played by the, the, the surrounding environment in the proton's dynamics. Does it cause it to decohere before it's had a chance to quantum tunnel across? Or does it thermally activate it to tunnel or even bounce over the barrier? Uh, and what we found uh, was, in fact, so this is a plot of tautomeric So this is the tautomeric prob the probability that the proton is sitting in GC, sitting on, on the, in the shallow well, right? The, the tautomeric side, the side that if the strands uh, separate with it being there, uh, that would lead to a mutation. Um, and, and you can see, so tautomeric prob probability plotted against temperature. OK, well, this is just a simple model. We can choose whatever temperature we like, but let's choose temperature of 300 Kelvin, which is more appropriate for biology. Uh, and you can see that as you bring the temperature down, if you only assume classical hopping over the barrier, uh, then, of course, as, as the environment gets colder and colder, uh, then it's less likely that it can thermally activate the proton over the barrier. But um, if you allow for quantum tunneling to take place, this plateaus out even at low temperature. And you can see at 300 Kelvin, it's 10,000 times more likely to quantum tunnel than to go over the barrier. So if it's going to get across, it's more likely to get across through quantum tunneling. But also, it's 
something like one in 10,000 chance that if you were to take a snapshot of uh, these protons between a pair of, uh, of bases, then, then it's a one in 10,000 chance you'll find the proton on the wrong side. Well, if finding the proton on the wrong side of the barrier and then the strand split is going to lead to a mutation, well, we certainly don't see mutations, you know, that would be rather catastrophic to life if these sort of mutations were this common, one in 10,000. It was more like one in, in a billion, it, that's more reasonable. Okay, um, so what, what we also uh, looked at, so this, so this is uh, uh, one that, what the potential well looks like. These are just energy eigenstates. Uh, in, you know, different energies in, in, in the well when there's no surrounding environment. And you can see you'd have to excite the proton up so that it's in a superposition of lots of these eigenstates, and there are some that would support, that would have a certain probability, non-zero probability in the shallow well. Um, the tunneling takes place, uh, and it uh, 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 oscillates to begin with, but, uh, but eventually it settles down at thermal equilibrium, so it's tunneling backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, and after about one picosecond, the situation doesn't change. Okay, it's, it's, it's relaxed. The chances of finding it on one side or the other is pretty constant uh, by that point. Uh, and the chance of finding it on the tautomeric side, as I say, is one, one in 10 to the 4. The other interesting thing we worked out was how long does quantum, this quantumness persist? Uh, and so what you can do is plot uh, uh, what's called the entropy. So this is the, uh, what's called the von Neumann entropy. It's, it's, a, it's a way of measuring, and it's not like thermodynamic entropy in classical mechanics. Uh, this is an entropy that gives us an idea of how long uh, quantum coherence persists or how quickly a system decoheres. Um, but, it, but you can think of it as, you know, sort of, uh, as it gets bigger, there's less and less quantumness in the system. Uh, and so the entropy, you can see again, this is plotted, every point along this curve is when that system has reached thermal equilibrium, plotted against temperature. Uh, and again, um, at uh, 300 Kelvin, you can see that the entropy is far from maximum. It's, it's far from fully decohered. So at thermal equilibrium, uh, in, in 300 degree Kelvin temperature, heat bath, there's still quantum tunneling going on. Uh, it's, even though it's thermalized, it's, it's a steady state, you know, forwards and backwards uh, tunneling. Um, so, so then the question was, well, if there's a 1 in 10 to the 4 chance that the proton's going to be in the wrong site, as the two strands unzip, as they enter the helicase, this enzyme that unzips them, uh, surely the potential barrier is going to get wider, it's going to get higher, you're going to trap the proton where it is. Uh, and, and we've got too much. We have far too many protons on the tautomeric side. Um, so uh, we looked at what happens as the strands start to separate as they enter the helicase. Uh, I'm particularly proud of this paper for, 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 for an un our undergraduate student, Ben King, who's the first author on the work. This is uh, for his master's uh, work as an undergraduate. He, he worked on this project. Uh, he, he was even delighted because the, the, the image that we gave the, the journal it, it, it was splashed on their front cover. So uh, he felt for his first publication, he, uh, he was very proud, deservedly so. Um, so what are we looking at then? So we have a, um, in, at thermal equilibrium, you have double proton transfer between base pairs. Um, uh, and, and you get this, for example, in GC, you get this potential shape. Um, but what happens? when the strand starts to separate, you get a, a different shape. You see that, that the, the, the potential well here that, uh, that allows for the proton to sit in has disappeared. And the reason it looks like in our simulations is that there's a, a particular enzyme, a, a asparagine, sitting right at the, 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 the entrance to judge as, as the strands separate that seems to affect the energy surface. It changes the energy felt by the protons. Essentially what's happening is that any protons sitting on the wrong side, basically most of them just roll back, roll back into the deeper well. Um, there are still more questions to, to, to address here, and bear in mind this is all still a computer simulation. There are no ex lab experiments to, to, to confirm what's going on here, but every time we add a little bit more of the detail, very often the, the story changes. The story so far is this, that 
you have the, 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 uh, the double strands of DNA as they enter the helicase. Uh, you have your, your cellular environment that's causing this partial decoherence. Uh, you know, it, it might help the proton excite it a bit, but at the same time might cause uh, decoherence. I don't know if you've heard this. There's something called the, the quantum Zeno effect. Uh, the watch pot never boils. If you constantly observe a quantum system, you stop it from evolving. You always collapse it back to its initial state. So in this case, the quantum Zeno effect will be the environment causes decoherence so quickly, it never lets the proton get across. But there's also the quantum anti-Zeno effect, where, where you, you help the thing uh, over, in this case, you, the, the environment so thermally activates the proton across. So there's a competition between the two. Um, what you have, basically, you've got the proton quantum mechanically. It's in both locations. Well, more correctly, it's a smeared out wave function covering, it's delocalized, covering both, both sites. Uh, and as it enters the helicase, the helicase, the helicase is, is Schrodinger, opening the box, looking at the cat to see if it's dead or alive. In this case, it's checking to see what side the proton's on. But at the same time that it does that, it, is that me clicking? Sorry, there was, there's a click, I know, I'm not sure, I've got connection. Anyway, I've nearly finished. Um, as it does the observing, it also changes the energy uh, seen by, the, by, by the, uh, uh, the proton and falls back. So you get far fewer protons ending up in the wrong site. Good, that's good, because we don't want that much mutation. So the conclusion there is that when it comes to proton tunneling, we'd always thought that it, quantum tunneling, um, life may have uh, selected for quantum tunneling, certainly like in enzyme catalysis. If quantum tunneling plays a role in enzyme catalysis, then you know, it's given it an advantage. It's helped things along. Uh, we needed it. In this case, life knows about quantum mechanics, and it knows it would be very detrimental, and therefore ha potentially has uh, evolved mechanisms to prevent uh, it potentially from, from, from uh, causing so many, so many mutations. So this is one of those big questions in quantum biology that, A, does quantum mechanics play a functional role in life, but, and, and B, has life evolved the ability to utilize quantum mechanics? And why wouldn't, I mean, if there's a trick that life's going to use, it's had long enough to figure it out. It's not magic, it's not you know, unusual, it's not something we should resist, which is not something we should believe unless we found evidence for it, but also it's not crazy that life would use quantum mechanics if it gave it an advantage. Okay, my final uh, couple of slides just talking about the future. There are various candidates for the mechanisms in quantum biology. I'm, I talked about en enzyme uh, action. Photosynthesis is still debated. Since the, the, the paper by Fleming and Engel, I think a lot of uh, people in the field are more skeptical now, to be fair, that you know, whether that, that photon undergoes long-lived quantum coherence or whether there's more sort of classical vibrations that can, can focus uh, and get the, the photon to the right position. And that's still whether, you know, that debate between quantum classical is still ongoing. Magnetoreception and birds, well, the leading candidate is, is this uh, radical pair mechanism. You have a pair of electrons sitting on an atom inside this, uh, this protein, cryptochrome, inside the bird's retina. A photon comes in and activates it. It knocks one of the electrons off that atom. Those two electrons are then quantum entangled, uh, uh, and, and the way they spin, the, the, the relative the, the ratio between spinning triplet and singlet states uh, is very sensitive to the orientation in the magnetic field. So I was very interested to hear uh, Martin's talk earlier about how maybe one can use nanodiamonds as sensors to see whether to, to test this, this idea. How we smell olfaction, well, that was, it was quite sort of fashionable for a few years, work by people like Luca Turin, but I think that's generally sort of faded away now. Again, the idea would be that electrons quantum tunnel as part of that mechanism. DNA mutations is the work that I've been talking about. And then there's the really, the, the, the tabloid headline type stuff. I list here, but I list here with a very strong warning. If, if quantum tunneling uh, can cause mutations, then uh, we can understand cancer if we understand quantum tunneling. Connection with the origin of life, connection with the nature of consciousness. This is the Penrose Hameroff ideas. Those ideas, yes, they are, you call them quantum biology, but we're a long way from even giving them any sort of respectability because you need to walk before you can run. And the walk involves having to find experimental verification for some of these ideas. Uh, and so the questions are first of all, 
how is long-lived quantum coherence maintained in the cellular environment? The, 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 uh, is the, has the cell evolved a structure in the environment? Maybe uh, molecular, the f frequencies of molecular vibrations have been tuned to resonate with um, the energy levels inside these, these systems, like this proton and the double well potential. Um, and, and how can we, so we can very, you know, can churn out theories <laughs> on a weekly, monthly basis for what's going on. They're meaningless unless, you know, they might as well be string theory or, or multiverse theories, uh, which are also science, but not, we're not able to sort of verify them experimentally. Uh, and so how do we test for these? Maybe we'll discuss this in the debate in a few minutes. Um, is quantum mechanics just along for the ride? Everything's made of atoms. Ultimately, everything's quantum, right, when you dig down enough. So is there something different between life and non-life? Uh, 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 or is just quantum mechanics just there and, and doesn't play any functional role? Uh, and if it does play a functional role, does that mean that life must have selected for, for it for, to give it an advantage? Uh, and then ultimately, was Schrodinger right? You know, did, did life have the ability to utilize quantum mechanics uh, uh, similar to uh, inanimate matter near absolute zero? Uh, if it does, then you know, one can speculate. I mean, I, I, some of you may be aware there was a big uh, fuss uh, 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 of a paper in Nature recently. Uh, Lee Cronin, a chemist in Scotland, and uh, Sarah Walker, who's down in Arizona, developed what's called assembly theory. How, essentially, uh, a recipe for how you can get from chemistry to biology, building molecules. Where, is there a, a, a quantum version of that? Uh, essentially, we are not steam engines, right? Well, although we maintain a, a far from an equilibrium state by taking low entropy energy in, coal in the case of uh, a steam engine, food in the case of, of, of life, uh, uh, to maintain our low entropy, but has life been able to sort of burrow down through the thermodynamic chaos to the, to the structure, discreteness of, of the quantum world? That is still the question in quantum biology. I don't want it to be true, I don't want it to be not true, I want to know what's going on. Uh, so quantum biology is still very much, still speculative, many would say still controversial, but the questions that it addresses I think are important enough that, that we should be thinking about them. And I will end with thanking my, my uh, group at Surrey, John Joe McFadden, Andrea Rocco is a, uh, a, a quantum physicist, theoretical physicist, Marco Saki is a, a computational chemist, Young Chan Kim, I, I, I had to apologize to him for relegating him down on the lower line. He's actually he's our quantum biology lecturer. So one of the things, when we got our Leverhulme Doctor Training Center, the university also provided us money for a new lectureship. Uh, uh, and Young Chan's a biophysicist uh, who uh, some of you may know uh, his work, but he's our new... The, I think he's probably the first person called a quantum biologist you know, in his title. Uh, and the rest are PhD students. I'm not sure why... Sapphire Lally's picture's gone, which is really bad because that was the only woman in the, on the... On <laughs> I'd, oh, okay. I don't know what happened. I, I, I do apologize to her. I, I, this sounds like, you know, when we talk about patriarchal uh, 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 science, uh, and <laughs> she, she was there and she was a fantastic, fantastic PhD student. I'll end there. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Lecture, and uh, given that it's speculative um, topic, I'm sure there are some comments, questions, challenging remarks. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Uh, thank you for this really, really interesting and mind-expanding uh, talk. Um, I think the very obvious question: Do, do you want to speculate, maybe, for? or a few sentences as to how you would start a measurement of those quantum tunneling effects? Um, yeah, so th there are various ideas. So if, if from, from, a, from a biological sort of wet lab perspective, one idea is to look at the kinetic isotope effect. So, you know, you, you grow E. coli in deuterated water, uh, and so after so many generations, one would hope that a large number of the hydrogen bonds are actually deuterium bonds. And if quantum tunneling is important, then now you've got a, a particle that's twice the mass. It's not just a proton, it's a proton and a neutron. Uh, and we know from quantum tunneling that you, know, you double the mass, you dramatically reduce the probability of, of, of tunneling. The problem there, of course, is you grow these E. coli, and, and, and if quantum tunneling leads to mutations, uh, then you know, what they're looking for is a, is a reduction in the mutation rate, 
But it, there could be a reduction mutation rate for a thousand reasons. E. coli just don't like deuterated water. Right? So I'm not quite sure how, how far that will go. Um, but there are other ways of you know, using so fluorescent spectroscopy, looking at things like gre uh, green fluorescent proteins, uh, where you, you, you know, you, you're looking at the effect of tunneling or you're looking at the effect of, of, of um, long-lived long quantum coherence. It, it, it is absolutely a challenge. As I say, theoretically, doing com um, uh, molecular dynamics, uh, chemical you know, computer simulations, we can do, and we can get ever more sophisticated, but how do you test that? That's why physicists don't like going into a subject like this, because, you know, where's my spherical cow in a vacuum? You know, <laughs> the living cell is far too complicated and messy. I, haven't, I can't control the dials and turn things down. You need the sort, of, the sort of tricks that Martin and others are talking about today to sense very sensitively what, what might be going on down at that nanoscale. So, um, if this is correct and happening, then if you would unzip a double-stranded DNA without the use of a helicase very quickly, you would find situations where you have this. Correct. Many people in the audience here do this on a daily basis. We see this is why I come <laughs> to these, these uh, conferences, to talk to people like that. Okay, right. So, and, and, and they don't see I, I don't know if they've, if they've checked it, but I think there are ways to actually do these experiments and figure out if something has changed in the DNA during this process. Okay. Well, yeah. I, I mean, that, that's what this would, would, would suggest, that if you, did it, if you did it quickly... I mean, there's a time scale issue as well, uh, that, uh, you know, that the separation time scale relative to the tunneling time scale uh, or the thermalization time scale as to you know, how quickly you can do it. If you do it too slowly, then it's, you know, the, the, the thing can adjust far, you know, far more quickly. But if you do it quickly enough, you trap the proton uh, in, in, on, on the wrong site with the same sort of probability that it has in, in, in equilibrium. But yeah, I'd be interested to know if people can do this. Okay, yeah, please. So, so very nice talk, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so if the discussion, coming back to discussion of the tautomeric forms of the mm. AT, well, one bond of the AT base pairing, I mean, if, if the role of hydrogen bonding, uh, this tautomeric form in one hydrogen bond, which is in AT, mm. is important, I presume that the role of water, which is providing hydrogen bonds continuously, is even far greater, right? I mean... Um, this effect is amplified because water is continuously forming hydrogen bonds with many yeah. groups in DNA and, and other molecules. I mean, all, yeah. all molecules, basically. Yeah, I mean, I think that... So what's the role of water? That, that's okay. my question. I, I mean, that's one of the to-do list things that we have to look at. You know, the, 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 the proton wouldn't necessarily just be transported or knocked elastically by a water molecule, it could, you know, these protons could be exchanged with the surrounding water and deposited out, uh, uh, on the other side. It's the same with the, the, the stacking, it's the same with intra-base proton transfer. One, you know, what happens once they split and then the protons are sort of side but decides it, you know, it can jump down to the other bond and just correct, the nucleotide corrects itself. So I think there are lots of other steps like that that still might change the story. I see, okay. There's one over there. Hi, um, yeah, thank you very much. That is uh, very inspiring. Um, so, as someone who grew up in quantum optics, I get a little confused about the use of the language quantum biology. You know, within quantum physics and quantum optics, there's decades of a little bit of maybe silly uh, uh, discussion over what's classical and what's semi-classical and what's quantum. Mm. You take something like a Van der Waals effect uh, and there are papers and papers of how much of the Van der Waals effect should be really purely quantum and how, of it, how mm. much of it could be described using classical picture. Although you know that the moment you talk about you deal with molecules and atoms, they are quantum objects, so there's absolutely yeah, no question yeah. about that, right? Now, taking that history that we have in our scientific community, I find it a little confusing to 
uh, refer to many of the things that are established now with a new language. I mean, to call NMR all of a sudden quantum sensing and to uh, refer to tunneling as a quantum effect. Uh, yes, it is a quantum effect, but within chemistry, this has been completely established. And we don't, every time yeah. that there yeah. is something like that happening, we don't get super excited because we yeah. learn that in our textbooks That's and right. then we just move on. Now, with that, it seems to me that where we could agree what is really quantum or not is uh, with the recent Nobel Prize that was given uh, for the so-called uh, second quantum revolution, mm. uh, where entanglement really becomes important, then maybe we could agree that this is really the really exciting kind of quantum stuff. So mm. what, what is your thought on that? I mean, can we agree on a little I, bit of I, semantics? Yeah, you're right. I mean, I, I said physicists don't like the field because biology is too messy. Biologists tend to not like it because they've not studied quantum mechanics. Chemists don't like it because they say, why are you inventing new names for things that we've all known for a long time? Uh, which, I mean, it's a fair point, but you have to put a, a dividing line. I mean, certainly chemical bonds ultimately are down to um, quantum mechanics, the quantum rules that decide how, you know, the periodic table is down to quantum mechanics, because it tells you how electrons arrange themselves in orbits according to Pauli principle and so on. So the chemical bonds, I wouldn't call that quantum biology. People tend to write and, and refer to it as, was it non-trivial quantum mechanics? It, but then you say, what do you put in that list? I put quantum tunneling in, along with long-lived quantum coherence and, and, and entanglement. Now, it may be that it, the, what we refer to as, you know, what happening in quantum technology today, the second quantum revolution, whether it's quantum sensors, quantum communication, quantum computing, the quantumness that goes on there, does that take place in living cells? That's what I would refer to as real quantum biology. Everything else is, well, of course life is quantum, everything's quantum at some level. <coughs> then maybe as a direct follow-up, I had you, you've asked my question much more eloquently, so thank you, but <laughs> I, I was uh, struggling for words. But, but I am then still confused. Why you seem to put an equal sign between tunneling and coherence. And you just said one sentence, we had all three in one sentence, tunneling, coherence, and entanglement. entanglement right. Do you see a difference between these concepts? Because the question was asked very clearly, right? Quantum tunneling. You give me a potential, I tell you the tunneling rate. We all know to do that. And quantum mechanics has been exceptionally good at predicting things, and they have always been true. Yeah. So we know how to calculate things. So it's not really that much of a mystery what to expect, when to expect tunneling and when, when not. And, and to use entanglement for functionality is something entirely different from saying here's a quantum tunneling effect. So why do we mix these three concepts in one sentence? Yeah, I, I, I hope, I'm, I, I'm sorry if I, it sounded like I was mixing them. They are quite separate. They tend to be the, the, the things that we refer to as what we look for if we want to say quant there's, there's some real quantum mechanics going on in biology. Quantum tunneling, you're right. I mean, that's why chemists just don't get excited by quantum tunneling, and, uh, you know, because we know it takes place, and it's not so crazy to take place inside living systems, but it's still, it's still a non-classical process. Uh, and yeah, I, but, well, I, I shrug my shoulders as well, because I come from nuclear physics, so I said, so what? You know, it's, you know I'm, I'm not gonna get excited by it. Yeah, quantum entanglement is different, uh, but I think, in, in theoretical physics as well, certainly in quantum information theory, uh, quantum entanglement is, is becoming much more foundational and fundamental. I mean, we have to teach quantum entanglement to undergraduates, <laughs> not just the Schrodinger equation and, and, and square barrier potentials. So quantum entanglement is foundational, fundamental, but to see it happening inside a, a, an environment where decoherence is very quick, before that that in process of entanglement can, can play a functional role, that will be a big surprise. And I think that would satisfy everyone, uh, uh, even those who, who, who don't get excited by quantum tunneling. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if there are no more questions, then let's thank Jim again. Thank you.